now that we've looked a little bit at um, so a little tiny bit of the specifics of cardinal and ordinal notions of infinity, just give you a tiny taste. I want to talk a little bit about the significance. Uh, what use is all of this? Um, why would you need to know this, especially if you just you know if you weren't studying it for its own sake? Well, let's start with cardinals. Um, why do you know your average working mathematician have to know at least a little bit about uh, these ideas of cardinals, and different kinds of infinity? Well. It's not so much that your average mathematician studies them for their own sake, usually. Um, but they're really inescapable when you treat sets as objects of study. So this isn't a talk about set theory in particular, but um, it really is the, the modern foundation of mathematics. And even if you don't use it as a foundation of mathematics, even if you use something else, you still are going to do something like collect stuff together in a set and think about them together. And when you do that multiple times, you are in unavoidably going to look, you're going to get in the situation that Cantor did of looking at bigger and bigger cardinality. So let me give you just one a, a quick treatment of one example. So the study, the modern study of area, like the area of regions of the plane. So the more technical term is measure, but I'll just say area. So we're, we're looking at the area of regions on the plane. Well, where do you start? Well, the area of a rectangle is easy. And there's really not that many rectangles. There's not that, that much you play we have with rectangles, just length times width. Um, so that's pretty easy and won't lead you into any really deep notions of infinity. Polygons, almost as easy. You can just slice them up into smaller pieces, you know, rectangles, tri excuse me, triangles, not so bad. As soon as you get to curvy regions, it's even a little bit tricky to say even what the area of that is in a very precise sense and be sure you have the right answer. And the modern notion, basically, is to slice it up into tiny rectangles and measure that, and then slice it even tinier and tinier and take the limit. And that's, this, that's the notion of, of infinity that was becoming familiar in calculus, that kind of uncompleted infinity, before Cantor um, came on the scene. But um, what about if you have like some fractal region? How do you know that that process, even if you have the calculus notion of, of um, of area, how do you know that's even going to work and make sense? And people discovered, again, um, it's, it's out of the same kind of research as it got Cantor interested in things, that that can be a very, very subtle, subtle thing. Okay. Well, what I just want to point out is that if you allow yourself to try to take the area of pretty arbitrary sets in the plane, we can ask ourselves, what kind of thing is this notion of area in mathematics? Well, it's a function. It's a function whose inputs in, inputs are regions in the plane. So you input some region in the plane, simple, moderately complicated, or very complicated, and outputs a real number. And the domain looks like you'd like it to be all possible regions in the plane. Now, it turns out that if you try to make it all, it doesn't behave very well. But it's pretty close. It's pretty darn close to all regions in the plane. And in fact, to, to see to talk about that subtlety, you definitely need set theory and you definitely need notions of infinity, to be honest. But even if you leave it aside that subtlety, we've just got something where we've put together essentially all subsets of, of what a set was already big, uh, the plane, the R2. Okay? So that's basically the power set operation. Okay? So we already started with the real numbers, the number line and the number plane, and already that's getting into uncountable sets. And if you really want to be careful about doing things there, you already need to know about uncountability. Now we're even going beyond that. We've got the plane, and we're looking at the power set of the plane. That's at least going to Aleph 2. Now, if you know, depending on the continuum hypothesis, it might not be equal to it. But it's at least a couple of steps above just plain old Aleph naught, the ordinary notion of infinity. And we're definitely having this idea of grouping all this stuff together and try to treat it as one object, the set of all sets in the plane. And that's really treating it as a completed infinity and a pretty decently big completed infinity, something that's even bigger than the, the smallest uncountable one. Okay, you, It even goes further than that. For example, um, there's different ways of measuring things that behave like area. Uh, one thing is instead, you see, I've got these very symbolically denoted. Like you could think about take all the subsets of the plane and look at how ordinary area behaves on those guys. Okay, that's an object of study, the study of the theory of ordinary area. You could do something very simple, which is just count how many points are in the object. Usually, you'll get infinity, but sometimes you'll get a finite number. Um, that's a perfectly nice thing. It's, it's similar to area, measure, a measure of size. 
You could also look at um, a weighted version of area. Suppose that some parts of the plane uh, have, are denser than others, um, and that would give you the mass of the region instead of the, of the area. Well, depending on how the weighting function changed, you could get all kinds of different versions of, of the mass of a region of the plane. So basically, we've got what turns out to be a very, very large infinite number of ways to do this because it's basically like taking the power set again. Each one of these guys basically had the, the, um, the power of the power set of R2, and now I'm taking the power set of that again. So roughly, we've got something that's at least at the L of 3 level. Um, and that is not a, a far-fetched example. If, if you look at how modern mathematicians deal with things, they will just blithely say, consider the, cl the set of all measures on R2 with certain properties. That's exactly what, what they're doing here. Okay, So um, that's one place where cardinals would come in. And in general, this idea of putting things together in sets and analyzing the sets and then analyzing the sets and sets of sets of sets is a very, very powerful thing. Um, so in addition to something that's almost unavoidable no matter what your foundation of mathematics is, it also happens to be the most powerful or well, popular foundation of mathematics. Um, again, not this isn't a talk about set theory, but I'll just mention everything in mathematics can be defined to be a set if you want. A single number, the number 5, can be defined to be a set. A function can be defined to be a set. I said it was a rule that relates one set to another, but you can actually figure out a way to define it as a set. Operations like addition and subtraction, points in the Euclidean plane, lines in the Euclidean plane, all of these can be defined to be sets. The nice thing about that is it unifies everything in a uniform foundation of mathematics with a relatively small number of axioms, most of which are completely unobjectionable, only a, a few of which are worth worrying about. Okay, But it's really cool that you've got this small number of axioms you start with, you create all of the rest of mathematics with it, um, not surprisingly, that's going to have some profound subtleties to it. Um, it's profound and it's mysterious when you get to the very outer reaches of what you can do with it. In particular, right at the start, there were a lot of initial objections that people found what seemed to be paradoxes right away in set theory. And in the initial formulations, they are truly paradoxes. They, they kill, kill those naive, simplistic versions of set theory. But we've pretty much figured that out. Um, but there's still, there's still definite, definite subtleties. For example, the continuum hypothesis we've already seen is uh, an example of something that you would have thought was either true or false, and it turns out you can't say it's true or false. So set theory really was one of uh, Gero Cantor's most controversial legacies um, initially. Um, it, was, uh, it was thought of uh, by many people as absolutely pestilential and a horrible idea. But nowadays, it's sort of seen as your best bet for a simple, rational foundation of mathematics and a way of thinking about a lot of mathematical ideas. So it's a really fundamental legacy that, that he had. What about ordinals, the significance of ordinals? What would you do with them? I've shown you a very particular example of if you have this kind of fun goal, and I'm not sure why you would, of uh, creating these unbelievably huge numbers. Um, it's What the ordinals did was it wasn't so much that they created the numbers themselves, they showed us that there was a way to think about the different algorithms, the different methods for creating those functions, and to organize them and to realize that there's kind of more and less powerful ways of doing that. Um, so there's incredibly close relation to two fundamental ideas in computer science. One is computability theory, very fundamental, which is basically what does it mean to compute, even in principle, what does it mean to compute something? So this has a lot to do with how people think about artificial intelligence, for example. And what problems are solvable by computational methods? And what problems aren't? And the idea that there's such a thing as an unsolvable problem was not something I think that uh, people had any clear idea of in the 19th century. And now we actually have a clear idea that there is such a thing. And they're interesting to study what's solvable and what's not solvable. This, um, that kind of, of study, um, you're going to have to know about ordinals to, uh, to understand that. Because, they, again, they organize different structures of computation, basically. Complexity theory is related. It's a little bit more down to earth. Um, it's not so much what problems are solvable in principle at all. It's what problems are efficiently solvable. How fast can you solve them? The famous P equals NP problem is part of complexity theory. And uh, it's kind of the, the more down to earth cousin of computability theory. 
but they share a lot of methods and a lot of ideas. So if you would, it would be unlikely you'd be an expert in complexity theory without knowing about computability theory, at least somewhat, and that has to do with ordinals and, and their, their structure. Um, related to that, not so much computer science, but basically back to the foundations of, of mathematics and even logic, um, ordinals actually turn out to serve as labels for different logical systems of different strength. What that means is that there's different ways of setting up uh, logical systems and foundations for mathematics, and some of them are purposely very, very weak um, with a very small number of assumptions of what you can do, what's, what it's legal to do in terms of methods of reasoning, and other ones are, are stronger that have more methods that m might prove more, and you can actually rank them and, f and say which ones are stronger than others, which ones are able to prove more, and it turns out that the way to label those is exactly by the ordinals. And so when you do what's called proof theory about, well, could I prove such and such result given these kinds of methods, then it actually is, is crucial to, uh, to look at ordinal numbers. Um, so in the next, the last part, I'll talk a little bit, tiny bit more about the history and um, the legacy of Cantor and various other people invented infinities and set theory. And I'll close with one of the most famous examples of the diagonalization idea. But that'll be in the next talk.